So now we're finally going to get to the definition of a group. And to give that definition of a group, we're going to try to remember some of the things that we've learned about symmetries and then abstract those. So turn them into something that isn't necessarily just about symmetries anymore. So the first thing to remember about symmetries is that you can compose them and get other symmetries. Likewise, a group is going to be a set G, so some things. And there's a function where you take two things from G, put them together, and get another thing from G. Just like when I take two symmetries, I put them together via composition, and I get another symmetry back. Another nice symmetry, a particularly nice symmetry, is the identity symmetry. And likewise, in a group, we're going to require that there's a special element, called, which we'll write as E, such that E times G is time, equal to G times E for every G in G. and G. This is the identity element. You can multiply it by anything, you get the same thing back. With symmetries, we can also always go back where we started. Likewise, in our group definition, we're going to say that for any G, there's something that we'll write as G inverse, so that G times G inverse is equal to the identity. The identity is like leaving things alone, right? So we go back to the place where we've left everything alone. That G inverse is the inverse. So we require that everything in our group has an inverse. That's a very important property. And finally, we have associativity. And associativity says that if we have G, H, and K, it doesn't really matter the order in which we multiply them. The order of combination doesn't quite matter so long as you know they're the same left to right. We can put parentheses however we want. And that's always true for composition of functions, so it will definitely be true for symmetries. So our definition, because you know, we've kind of adapted it from our idea of symmetries, is automatically going to work for symmetries of objects. So if I think of symmetries of a tetrahedron, that set of symmetries of the tetrahedron is automatically a group. And we're going to call that the group of symmetries of the object. But wait, that's not all. We've actually abstracted our definition. And our definition is going to apply to a lot of other things than just groups of symmetries of objects. So here's an example. If you think of the integers with the operation of addition, not multiplication, but addition, it gives you a way of taking two integers, combining them, and getting another integer back, like 1 plus 5 equals 6. There's an identity integer, which we know is 0, where x plus 0 is 0 plus x is equal to x. Inverses are just negative numbers. If you add a number to the negative number, you get back to 0, back to the identity. And we know that addition of integers is associative. So the integers with the addition operation form a group. In our group definition, we wrote multiplication, but actually the operation doesn't matter. What if we try to multiply integers? There's an identity element, 1, that's fine. But as soon as you think of inverses, if you think of x inverse under multiplication, then you're going to be looking at things like 2 inverse, which is 1 half, which isn't an integer. So that's a problem. So here's an exercise. Take the rational numbers and get rid of the number 0. So all of the rational numbers except for 0, and show that the rationals form a group under multiplication. To check that something is a group, you need to show four things. So you have to check that multiplication always gives, is going to give you another rational number back. You're going to have to check that there's an identity, that inverses exist, and that the multiplication is associative.